look, I mean, the school of the Spirit is where you and I get hooked up with the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost himself. And you can do it your way or you can do it the way God described. You can, and, and religion, listen, fear is a formidable foe. And within the realms of fear is self-consciousness. Within the realms of fear are the intimidations, uh, the uncertainty, the insecurity. What a terrible prison. And uh, we, can we can choose whether we are going to live. There, there, there is like, there is four dimensions, if you would, of reality. Are you with me? Here, hang on. I'm going to show you. It's called, it's called inference. It's called anecdotal. And it's called fact. And it's called truth. In the realms of the inference, the anecdotal, and the fact is the realms of imagination, okay? So you really could break that down into two, zo two zones. Imagination or reality, fantasy or reality. And when we talk about reality, I'm talking about absolute reality, something that by and large, intellectualism as a whole would reject. An absolute reality, and then with that, which is a part of that, is absolute truth. And of course, everybody in here that's been through the, the process and received the lobotomy, you recognize there is no absolute truth and there is no absolute reality if you, if you have been uh, engaged in the process. But that's an, abs that's an absolute lie. <laughs> because there is an absolute reality and there is an absolute truth and that's what the Holy Ghost has come to do. And it's, it's a hard job. It's a hard job. It is a difficult thing to get you and me out of the realms of all the inference. What did they say? Tell me, what did they say? Well, and then they go on for like, you know, um, they go on for 10 minutes saying what they thought you said. And then in the last five seconds, they may actually hit on a little bit of what you really did say. And so we treat Father that way. Um, you know, if, if, if you were able to pay attention to... Um, uh, the, the, a newspaper or the news media. What they'll do is they'll take 1% of a fact. They don't, even got, they don't even have the truth. They'll take 1% of the fact. They will embed it with anecdotal. It, 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 there seems to be evidence for it, but there's no established proof. You can't reproduce it. You can't really bring the bear, the, the evidence that would be immiscible, right, in court, right? It's anecdotal. It, it's kind of fit. Are you with me? It looked that way. Now, we're not sure if it's that way or not, but it looks that way. Huh? And so what happens is we find ourselves living in this realm that every area of, of, our, of our lives kind of dictates to us. So you got CNN and Fox News, basically owned by the same company. And, you know, just look, doctor it up for the conservatives because this is what they want to hear. And doctor it up over here for the liberals because this is what they want to hear. And here's an in-between, folks. And so they take 1% of fact, and then they doctor that up, embed it in anecdotal, so it's believable. It's more believable. Yeah, that kind of makes sense. It's got to be logical. Otherwise, forget about it. You're an idiot. And then they, so it's, it's embedded in anecdotal, and it's all spin or inference. Now, how do you, how, do you feel comfortable living your life that way? No. Well, then you're going to have to stop doing it. And somebody said, what, what, what on earth are you talking about? What do you think? Huh? What do you, what do you think? You know? Uh, that we're doing with our time. What, you, 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 think we're just, you think we're all checked out? No. I think that you're immersed in a realm of humanity. And you're e immersed in a realm of experience that you're going to have to find an exit door to. you have to break away from. Now, the Lord lays out for so, uh, something that is very, very challenging. His word. His word tells us how to act and how to behave. It's fine to forgive everybody so long as you're not hurting. <laughs> it's good. It's good to have mercy and to forgive everybody as long as that person didn't hurt you. Was, when, when we're not hurt, boy, we're just talking, we're preaching a sermon, man. It's good. But as soon as we're hurt, as soon as we've got a spirit of offense, you can't, though you know it's truth, you can't apply it. You think. Well, this Holy Ghost, the Holy Ghost has come to fundamentally establish us in truth. 
And that's not subjective, which is a very wonderful thing. Because somebody can't tell me, come to me and, and start telling me a bunch of stuff. Folks, uh, um, some people are challenged by me in my relationships because I'm always asking questions. And unfortunately, I ask them some challenging questions. And, you know, why do you have to, qu why do you have to question every time? Because it's good. I can come to more full understanding. And I don't say this, but so can you. Okay? <laughs> Because if we're, quite, if we're asking questions and it's about the purpose of coming to a full understanding of things, well, well, well my goodness, that, that's extremely valuable. However, in our lives, we got all these, got all these circumstances, all this situation, all this information that is coming to us and it's mandating our absolute approval. And if not, we're not careful, we've got a reflex and we're actually doing it subconsciously. We're approving it. We're saying, yes, that's accurate. Yes, that's what they did. Yeah, that's what's going on. Yeah, that's what I need. Yeah, that's what I feel. And it's imagination, man. In fact, the Lord says, and you know, if you want to understand how to walk in the Spirit, if you want to understand how to mind the things of the Spirit, how to have the mind of Christ, how to function in this realm where all of these other uh, Things are trying to impose themselves on us, and it's running interference of clear vision. It's running interference of discernment. If you get emotionally compromised, you cannot discern nothing. Well, I'm, I want you to realize that it's right. I want it to become apparent reality to you, because you know that's the more important issue. And and I could actually help you understand where where you don't where you actually are emotionally compromised, if you would like. But what happens is we don't, we get, when we start getting down to that level of exchange, <laughs> hey, keep it general, keep it general. I'm here in the school of spirit here. I don't want to get picked on. Okay, what happens is we, <laughs> we decide whether or not we're interested in running around the block or being trained for the Olympics. There you go. Okay, yeah. <laughs> are you listening to me? Because yeah. anybody get out and run around the block. You know, I think you could be like 500 pounds potentially and run around the walk. But to train for the Olympics is in that, oh, wait a minute. Everything that you do, every movement that you make, everything's costing you a second, a millisecond, a microsecond. Everything. Huh? Every, everything, every posture, every, <laughs> every muscle <laughs> tone. And so it's like super critical. Well, just, the Holy Spirit wants to be super critical of us. I want to be in the school of spirit, but I don't want to be no super critical stuff because I just can't take it. Why can't you take it? Because you create an imagination, imaginary, imagine, imaginary, imaginary, imaginary world for yourself. And the Holy Spirit wants to come and blow the thing up. And no one wants to listen to this. Come on, man, let's get into the word of knowledge. Let's, we're, get, we're trying. I don't want to talk a lot to say it. I'm, we're trying. We want to get you, and, and, and really, we, I want to get you out of the imaginations. I want to get you out of the fear. I want to get you out of all this spin. And I want you to get you over here into this place where you're just consecrated to the truth. And, and how, how do we get to learn the truth? The Word of God tells us. He tells us the proper behavior. Everything else is going to be an imaginative thing that's going on. It's going to be a subjective, a subjective thing that's going on. And you just don't want to do it. You don't want to get caught in that monkey trap. You know, you know what a monkey trap is? The monkey reaches in to the cage. He grabs the banana, and now he's trapped. Huh? Because the power of his desire is greater than any other impulse that he can have. All he's got to do is let go of the banana, and he's free. He's not going to let go. All he can think of is banana in mouth. <laughs> so, you know, the person can walk right up to the monkey and throw the net over him. Because all he can think of, there's a net. I'm getting ready to be captured. Banana. I got to have a net. <laughs> it just, and we don't want to believe that we could possibly be like that. But unfortunately, we all are. And the only possibility of exclusion is the Holy Spirit. And so he's going to come and radically do some, some amazing things. He's in, you know, uh, somebody said, ah, they started talking to each other in the Holy Ghost. One would go, and the other one would go, that's your reception. What was going on? They weren't talking to each other. They were responding to the anointing. 
Bende se para. Kama tiru mo sin. Begin a monsite. Sai pa mo no paya. It begin to bring response. I watch tongues take, cast out devils. There's a bathroom. And somebody just get delivered of, uh, of a stronghold. Of, and, and sickness and disease go out of the body. Huh? Bring wisdom and revelation. Result in the word of knowledge. Change the, change the atmosphere so a greater level of miracles can work. I mean, it's when I, when I was with some preachers the other day, some of you heard me say this already, but I'll say it again because I really, I really mean it, and I want you to understand it. And uh, I was talking to them about being translated. I said, yeah, I practice translation all the time I'm because tra I've got some things I want to do, and I've got to be translated in and be translated out. And they're like sitting there looking at me like, how do you practice translation? And one of the dear brothers preached, been a Assembly of a God preacher for right at 45 years. And just a wonderful, lovely man of God. And I, I said, well, you really want to learn, dear brother, how to do this. And he said, absolutely. I've never heard anybody practicing translation. I said, I'm going to do it for you right now. Are you ready? <laughs> I'm getting ready. Are you ready? He's like, he's like I think I am. <laughs> What's going to happen next? I've never got to see anybody going to show me how to practice translation. What are you going to like start vaporizing on this? Are you going to start transitioning in and out? <laughs> are you going to disappear for a couple of seconds and then reappear? What's going to? And I just started bastating. Of course, I build it up. I said, get ready. Because the whole atmosphere is going to change in here. We just got finished eating. I said, the whole atmosphere is going to change. So I really built it up. And then I started. And then everybody immediately got it. Because it's true. This is the school of the spirit. It is the first gift without limitation. It's the entrance gift. It's the one Satan fights the hardest. Huh? He wants to come along and bring all these other things that will impress folks around you. Very few people are impressed when you start masticating. <laughs> There's really not, they, they're not drawing near, they're, they're, they're getting further away. <laughs> Especially if they're religious. And, you know, I have some of my, you know, my, most of my, so many of people in my family are ministers. And I have cousins that are, you know, Northern Baptist preachers, um, you know, Christian Missionary Alliance. And boy, I, I start, if I start speaking in tongues, they file out the door, the devil. You know, and they're kind of, because they, 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 they've been taught, you know, this manifestation of an evil spirit. No, it's the Holy Spirit. And, of course, they don't file out the door anymore because they don't even come over <laughs> oh, so we look like crazy men now they're gonna all think you're crazy yeah but just hang on just hang on because the secrets of your heart are about to be made manifest and people talk about ah well we don't believe it's supposed to be good and done without any interpretation and they grieve the holy ghost saying it and so they don't have any prophecy either so they say they believe in prophecy because they start line upon line, start sorting out 1 Corinthians chapter 14. See, you're supposed to just prophesy. Well, go ahead. How about a miracle? Can we do a miracle in church? Oh, yeah. But well, you don't have any, do you? No, you don't. Why? Because you agree to the Holy Ghost. You tell the Holy Ghost what he can and cannot do. The only place you're going to find miracles, prophecy, signs, wonders, word, knowledge is a place where the Holy Ghost has freedom to be kind of a sultan. Because that's how we define Pentecost. Somebody said, oh, that's not the, well, the definition of Pentecost. Well, give me another one. <laughs> Clothed in tongues of fire. Rushing mighty wind. I'm happy with all of those. But the biggest outworking of event, the biggest abiding event, huh? No, you know, Paul didn't come to the, to, to the disciples at Ephesus and say, have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? And, 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 and then we see rushing mighty wind and clothing tongues of fire. No. We saw a total of money did eat and they all began to speak with their tongues. Same way with Cornelius' house when Peter went there. We understand these things. I, we don't, you don't have to have some, you know, brilliant person come break this down for you. It's just too simple. It's right there before us. Though we do not understand it, it doesn't fit within the framework of our perception. 
anecdotal. Doesn't fit within the framework of our inferences. Doesn't fit within the framework of what people call facts. Huh? Facts and truths are, are literally realities apart from one another, for the most part. Truth is very, very, what God said in his word is true. You may have zero in your bank account, and that may be fact, but God said, I provide for you everything that you have need of. That's truth. Now, what are you going to believe? And whatever you, wherever, wherever you move, whatever your heart and your emotions, wherever, your, wherever your thoughts go to, I'm, that's what you're going to get. You know, you're going to have to get wise enough to say, I need some help. God says, good news, I send you all the help you need. Amen. And he, called, he literally called the Holy Ghost help. But he said, you're going to have to come in the school of the Spirit. So people are always raising their hand, oh, I want to be a part. I want to come under the authority. I want to learn how to submit to God. I want to learn how, you know, to come under the rule. But the reality of it is, over and again, they, they, I think early on in our walk with God, we take one of two roads, okay? We either become hearers of the words and doers, and we take that road, or we're hearer of the words, and then we take the road of forgetful hearer. Forgetful hearer. So we're always hearing and never doing. We're always hearing. And, and you know, the Lord said to me one time, right out of Ezekiel, he said, <laughs> literally, and he put this on me, and you may think this is self-serving, but... I got it. He said, you're as one who plays the, vi the viol viola pleasantly and one has, who has a beautiful voice. They sit and they listen to you, but they will not do it. Well, th that, I believe that that's God's people in general who function on the anointing. And how do we begin to quantitate these things in our life? How do we begin to quantitate, am I living by the word of God or am I living by imagination? Am I in the realm of reality? Because you're not going to get the Holy Ghost to play pretend. He's, he's the spirit of truth. He's not hooking up with partial truth. This is the biggest challenge for people to step in the school of the spirit. And people don't want to do it. So what happens is a familiar spirit intercepts them. I wish Gustavo was here tonight. Because Gustavo, I told Gustavo, I said, you go nowhere. And if you do, this is what's going to happen to you. One, two, three. And then all of a sudden, the person functioning under, uh, in a church under the influence of a, a familiar spirit begin to give instructions, names, almost like addresses, literally names, situations, and then said, go ahead and do it. Huh? Huh? Listen to me. You, you know, you, we've got to watch out for these things, people. Because you can, you can start operating in something that looks like a word of knowledge. It's not a word of knowledge at all. And it almost killed Gustavo. Because he almost died. I mean, he, he bar they, they barely resuscitated him. Everything I hap said happened, happened so quick. And I thought it was going to actually take a little bit longer than it did. One, two, three. Bang, bang, bang. Point, point, point. This is what you do. <clears throat> I, was, I was speaking to him out of the realms of the Spirit of the Lord. I, I devoted myself. Wait, I understand the foundation. The foundation is I want to I wanna live in truth. I want to hear the Spirit of truth. I don't want to live in a partial truth. I don't want to live in a mixture. I, I'm ready to just have my heart right. I, I just want it, I want it your way, God. And your way is very clear. Bless them who persecute you. You're going to have to have some help to do that. To walk around with a pure heart so you don't take offense from anybody? Come off it, man. You're going to have to have some help. Because your imagination, your spin, your, all these things are going to get involved and it's going to emotionally compromise you. <laughs> huh? It's going to spiritually compromise you. And I don't care how much you want to walk in the Holy Ghost. I'm not, I tell you, there's a lot of people in hell that meant to do right. It's just true, people. It's just true. We just have to just get real sober and say, you know what? I'm going to walk in truth. I'm going to do what God says to do. Hallelujah. I'm, I'm going to learn how to keep a pure heart. I'm going to learn how to not have offense. Hallelujah. I, I, people say, well, I, I really want to, somebody said to me, well, I really want to understand how to be in submission under authority. I said, the last thing I need is another text message and another email. 
The last thing I want to do is tell you whether to eat crunchy peanut butter or smooth peanut butter. Everybody's got it wrong. It ain't even about that, man. It's about how do you get your heart right with God? You say, Father, here I am. Shine a floodlight of heaven upon my soul. I want everything that you don't want in my life out of my life. I want it to be coming into the spotlight so it, is, it can be revealed to me for what it is. And the Lord makes it really simple. And he, and he allows us, you know, he, you know, I believe it's so easy to get started with Father because he just takes us for whatever we say, whatever comes out of our lips. Lord, please forgive me. I mean, you look at Ahab, right? We know that Ahab wasn't really deep with his repentance, right? He was, he, he had, he, there was only one king that had led Israel into greater wickedness than Ahab. And uh, that was Manasseh. And, of course, that was the southern kingdom. Whereas Ahab was in the northern. And, um, but yet when he repented, and so really we're in the fact that the northern kingdom, nobody was, no one outdid Ahab. Ahab was married to Jezebel. And he let Jezebel rule and whatever she said, he did it. And, but at any rate, you know, he just, God said, it's over. And he put on sackcloth and he put on ashes and he repented. And, and what did the Lord, such, the Lord's such an easy touch. He said, look at Ahab, how he repents. I'm not going to do what I said I'd do. This is the, how the Lord is. And obviously, his repentance wasn't very deep in his heart. And it's like the Lord just kind of leaves that, you know. He just leaves it. Because obviously, Father could look in and see. Say, you're not serious. I'm sure, sure that at that moment, Ahab was serious. And Father took it for what it was. Because we know that Ahab backslid no sooner than the Lord said, I'm not going to do it. It's just the goodness of God. God didn't backslide. So, but we have to listen to something. The Lord says, I'm going to put fire to your heart. I'm going to put the test to your heart. And he says that in a radical way. He says, silver is for the furnace. <laughs> and tin, and also says it was gold. We'll just use tin for this particular example. Is for the smelting pot. But the heart is what I'll try. Huh? I'm going to try your heart. And so we find ourselves getting in challenging situations that the Lord actually allowed to be set up for us. And he, what, he's, what he's wanting us to do is he's going to say, are you going to walk in your imagination? Are you going to exalt your imagination as supreme? Because you figure your spin, your anecdotals, your inference, you really believe you've done wrong. It was wrong direction. It was just wrong. And then you got a wrong attitude. Then you're emotionally compromised. Now you're hearing from God and you heard nothing. Huh? I've watched so many years. I've been pastoring for 35 years. I've watched so many people do interesting things. And uh, one of the most interesting things that I know of is where people come sit in the meeting and they never do anything God said. Because here the... <coughs> Here the Lord takes a, an anointing and he declares his word and he speaks it in general so that there can be specific application so that people can grow. He leaves everybody, you know, he leaves the sensational out of it by and large to bring the reality to bear about it being on the inside of us wanting to do it. Real motives. And people come and they'll, they'll hear their hearers, their hearers, their hearers. They never do it. Or rarely do they apply it. And then all of a sudden, they come to you and tell you that the Lord told them that they were supposed to go start a church down the road. you got to be kidding me. Look, I, I said to people, I said, look at me. Can, can you see me okay in here? Do I look stupid? Do you think that I'm stupid? You haven't obeyed God one single time since I've known you. And now you're telling me God's speaking directly to you? When you haven't heard, hearkened to his voice for all these years, and now he's talking to you, and you're the only one who's hearing it. You know what? You're living in la-la land. Imaginations run wild. Well, people, I, I have to emphasize this because I want you, God wants you, you want you to step into the realms of all this beautiful, glorious thing. You want to be, you want to be laying in bed at night. Father, come give you a vision, come minister to you, revelation, and it don't end up an entirely different word by morning. Because it got all mixed up with your mixture and your imagination, and, you know, are you listening to me? 
He segregated us under the truth to teach us his truth so that we become in every way responsive to that which is reality, which is only defined in his presence. Truth isn't relative. Facts are. That's relative. Truth isn't. Truth is absolute. The Lord tells us how to forgive from the heart. He tells us how to, how, shows us how to walk free from offense, how to have a pure heart. He gives us the rules of it. Humility, trust, lowliness, meekness. But where, where do you find in your life, where do you find in your life that you're able to quantitate this. I think it's challenging for people to realize that it's difficult for them to include God in their life one hour a day in Bible reading. It's challenging. Nobody believes that about themselves. Until all of a sudden somebody's hovering over top of you saying, okay, have you got it now? Where are you at now? Huh? Uh, we always have all the reasons. Legitimate. Excuses. In our own minds. Huh? But, oh, we're keeping God first. We're keeping God first. Well, what happened? Uh, let me tell you why we couldn't do it. Okay? Because we needed clothes. Because we needed food. Because I never found anybody in this category who missed supper. <laughs> I never found anybody who missed breakfast. They got over to the grocery store and got it done in their schedule. Yeah. But the kingdom of God's first and his righteousness. No, 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 no. You're messing it up. I'm, on, I'm popping your bubble. I'm going to bring you over here into some reality. I'm going to get you to measure. Well, we're not supposed to. I never measured anything. Well, oh, buddy boy, you need to get to measuring because you're living in a fantasy land. You think you're reading the Bible 10 hours a day and it's a struggle to get 30 minutes in when you're measuring it. My goodness, I couldn't remember how I couldn't believe how little I prayed until all of a sudden I committed myself to prayer. And then I set the alarm clock so I wouldn't go over. That's how, that's how confident I was. Oh, I'm going to go over. I'm going I'm to pray for an hour. I looked up and five minutes hasn't gone by. I'm like, what's wrong with that alarm clock? <laughs> is, it, is it broken? <laughs> yeah, because relativism is a terrible thing. Huh? You're on a hot stove. One minute's an eternity. Are you listening to me? You're holding hands with a pretty girl, and now, my goodness, <laughs> you know, hours or seconds. Are you listening to me? The relativisms of our lives. Our way with it. God, the Holy Ghost, come to try to help us. And He's saying, You're going to have to stop doing what it is you're doing. I'll, I'll change your heart. I delivered you. I'll give you a new heart, a new spirit. But you've got one thing you're going to have to do. You're going to have to learn how to recognize the difference between me and, and you. You're going to have to learn how to recognize yourself. And every time you take offense and every time you hurt and every time you, you know, you've got your reasons and, you know, your legitimate excuses to have a problem with somebody because most everything is relational. That's why love fixes all everything. Most everything has at its, every problem has at its center a relationship. That's why love fixes it. And it's not a kind of love that you're gonna, you and I are going to find within ourselves. Innately, in other words, innately. That we were born with. We're going to find that as a supply from the Holy Spirit. And so now we're going to have to all of a sudden understand how beautiful and how impactive and how beneficial a dialogue is. And when we begin to dialogue with the Holy Ghost and we begin to talk to Him, we see a need and we don't look to it in ourselves or we don't get all silent about it and remorseful and meditative, but we ask, ask the Holy Spirit. The Lord says, you have not because you ask not. And then when you ask, you're asking an imagination. That's what He says. I know most King James Bible said you ask amiss. An imagination. A fantasy. Huh? That you may consume it in what? Can you fill in the blank? In your own lust. Well, you know what? That's a big moment of, that's a big moment of, of, of confrontation and encounter with God. Wow, I now have been able to sort out what comes out of the realms of, of my own concept of strong desire. 
versus what is the will of the Father. What a, what a breakthrough, what a moment of breakthrough. What a moment of breakthrough when you can identify the difference between yourself and the Holy Spirit. Majority of what we let go down in our life is by our own self-interest and self-dictates. And we say it's God's word and we don't measure it. So, you know, it's just, it's just, this is essential. Unless, if you want the pure thing, if you want the real thing, if you want to function in miracles, signs, wonders, healings, you want to function, function in the things that God has fully given to us. I mean, I'm going to tell you right now, this, these, this realm of attendance to God's word will create within you such boldness, will create within you such confidence. When you still lay aside the self, when you're able to recognize the difference between the Holy Ghost and yourself. Wow. That is a moment of great wisdom. That is a moment of great insight. And then you, we, we understand this. There's a responsibility. The Lord's saying, you want to walk in the anointing? Well, the anointing has you, been given to you, special anointing. It's a sonship anointing that's been given to you so that you have the ability to dwell in the Holy Ghost, to dwell in the holies of holies. That's what the anointing is. It's the ability to stand in the place of God's holiness. You, so, Father, he's given us... He, He's given us this ability to stand in his place and now to be led by him, to live in him, walk in him. But there is, a, there is a function that you must be willing to do. You must deny yourself daily. And now religion puts its spin on it. You know, different people with their ideas put their spin on it. And then to make it everything from, you know, going up into a cave to dwelling in a convent and, you know, walking around in sackcloth and ashes all your life. No, 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 no. It's something far more practical than that. Because you can dwell in the cave and still be ruled by yourself. And live with the haunting thoughts of yourself all day long. <laughs> or a convent or wherever else. Or it says you want to walk in the fullness of the spirit? You're going to have to learn how to deny yourself. Re reality of it is, most of us can't even recognize ourselves. You go, what? Now we know that you are a madman. No, you don't even recognize yourself. You have never really pared it out. You've never pared out what is of self-interest, how you're motivated out of self-interest versus being motivated out of the unction of the Holy Ghost. And the way that that begins to pare out is how willing you, how willing you are to respond to the Word of God and obey the Word of God. way that you begin to quantify that, how much do you get offended? How much do you have to deal with unforgiveness? How much do you have to deal with personal lust? How much do you have to go be, with strong desires? And how much are you taken by, taken by then, which, is, which now is built on that, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and pride of life? Because now we know that's not the Holy Ghost. And how is it that the Holy Ghost, is a, that un, unholy spirit, is able to so access me and so in, impose upon me an unholy desire. When, when, when we know that one of the hubs of scriptural revelation concerning the new heart and the new spirit is that he's written his laws upon our heart and upon our mind that we will do them. And where, where John even takes it to another level beyond Jeremiah, another level beyond Ezekiel, another level beyond what Jesus said, another level beyond what Paul said to the Hebrews. And he said, we know that everyone who's born of God does not sin. He keeps himself, and why not? He keeps himself, and the wicked one cannot touch or access him. And then he says to us, he says, hey, let me give you the secret. The word abides in me, and I've overcome the wicked one at every point. Thy word abides in my heart that I might have sinned against you. The entrance of the word gives understanding. <laughs> you know, and, and, and somehow we, just, we, don't get those, we don't connect those dots. And circumstances and situation and self-interest so runs interference that we're having a hard time finding one hour a day to read the Bible. But in our imagination, oh, no, 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 man. We've, oh, two hours easy. You know, an hour, oh, there's no, an hour? You're kidding me. Somebody walked up to you and said, hey, do you read, could you, do you think you could read the Bible faithfully one hour a day? Well, of course. Try it. Let me see. Because my experience is that's not true. My experience of watching people for 35 years, that is not true. God is prioritized to the very bottom, in most cases, while out of their mouth, they're saying, I'm seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And it's complete and entirely, verifiably, quantitatively imagination. 
So that's why Paul said, and you know, and emphasizes this in um, Second Corinthians. He says to us, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God. Or literally, the weapons of our warfare are not of human ability, but they are God power at work with us. To do what? To pull down strongholds. What are strongholds? They're not just demonic influences. That's cultural reference points. That's the way that you've been conditioned. That's how you were taught to interact on, on the playground in elementary school. And it's not necessarily wrong, some of the things that were taught there, but there was a framework there that is wrong. And you gotta be careful. God wants to, somebody said to me one time, I was in the jungle somewhere, and they said to me, oh, you need to be sensitive to your culture. I'm not, I don't care nothing about your culture. You watch what God's gonna do now, because I'm telling you, I care nothing about your culture. I'm not come here to bow down to your culture or bring you Western culture. I've come here to declare the kingdom of God culture. It's a whole nother realm. It's another culture. I've got to be sensitive to culture. I come here to cast your culture out you. I come here to totally, I've come here to totally tear down your culture. And if I told you some of the Indonesian culture, you'd go, praise God. I actually had an anthropologist say, oh, you guys are doing these people with such an injustice. Are you kidding me? Do you know what they do in their cultic worship to the demons they're trying to appease? Give me a break. You think that's good for their kids? Give me a break. <laughs> you think getting sliced up and, and cut up in so many different ways and burned and, and psychologically tormented and harassed, had, you know, let down into a dark hole and covered up? You well, give me a break. I come here to break the power of that thing. Huh? I was so blessed by John. He just called me up. He's in Havana right now. He's getting all the pastors together. And some of these guys from the big missionary, whatever, Pentecostal place, oh, you could have to be real sensitive to their culture. He just turned and looked at him. He said, if I, were, if I were sensitive to their culture, God would do nothing. God will do nothing in this place. You won't have miracles. You won't have signs. You won't have wonders. You'll have religion. That's it. That which appeases men is an abomination to God. He's not going to cooperate with it. It's not about being rude. It's not about being uncaring. It's not, not, not about being kind and being generous and being gentle. It's about being real. <laughs> it's about knowing what's behind that thing. I come to cast that thing out. I come to deal with a stronghold. Well, before I'm ever going to deal with a stronghold in a nation or in somebody else's life, I'm going to have to deal with a stronghold in my life. Because until I've dealt with a stronghold in my life, I have no power, no authority to help anyone. This is, a, this is the painful reality. Because we, we want to go be champions for God. Meanwhile, back at our own lives, it's one messed up situation. Amen. And praise God he didn't say, look, I tell you what, guys. I'm going to give this great opportunity. But first of all, you're going to have to work out your mess. And when you get yourself all fixed up, straightened up, where I can stand and even look at you. <laughs> Because you guys are so out there in play, play, play land. You're so, I mean, just think about it. meeting some empty-headed person. Right? You with me? It's like, you know, you can be kind and generous, but you're not looking to hang out. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> huh? <laughs> Best up there in them Appalachian Mountains. Huh? You're not looking to hang out. What do you think? think about what Father has to deal with humanity. I mean, come on. What he's done is he's come and he's gifted us. I've got a love that's greater than anything ever made before. I got a love that's greater than anything ever created. I got a love from heaven. I thought, well, a lot of times I want to sing a song one time, boy, that one hasn't left me. Made for me by Jesus. I got a love that never fades, a gift from the ancient of days. Now, he's empowered us. He tries in every way that goes comes to try to show us this vision of such greatness, of such splendor, of such privilege. And if we, if we mess up and violate that 
opportunity, that heavenly vision, that Holy Ghost interaction, that message from heaven, that download from God, that operation of Christ Jesus in our life. If we somehow prioritize that or didn't put it where it needs to be, how is God going to be able to speak any deeper words to us than that? Meanwhile, we're back over here saying, I want to function in the gift of the Spirit. Why didn't somebody get healed when I prayed for him? So, Father is just very real with this. He don't care how long it takes because if you and I get with this process, he'll do more with our lives in one day, in one day, than we could have done in a, in a lifetime if we lived to be a thousand years. Huh? And serve God faithfully. One day, God will do more in our life by his spirit. In 1985, I told my wife, I said, listen, the uh, um, leader of the uh, People's Republic of China, 1985, took... Uh, Mao Zedong's place said, I want, I want Western uh, educators, come on in. I said, let's go to China. And the Lord said, no, I want you to go to China. I want you to go to San Diego. And so um, we obeyed the Lord. In 2001, I was sent by two of the primary house church leaders of China, which are over literally countless millions of people. And in one week I did, was, I was able to be more influential in one week than I would have been if we would have gone to 1985 and been there from 1985 to the year 2001, 2000, and it was 2001. Father just, Father don't need all of our doings. He just simply needs us to be obedient to him. Let him establish things in our life. He wants us to get real. He wants us to get simple. Huh? Hmm. He wants, he wants us to learn how to let him be our visionary, to be our vision. And where does that begin? It begins with the simplicity of the word. How are you going to be faithful to God? How are you going to be faithful to the things that he's given you to do? Especially where men can't see. It's all about just you and him and your relationship. It's all about the activities of your, of your desires and of your emotions and what you're doing. Huh? And we all faced with it. Today, somebody sent me a link. A preacher sent me a link because he wanted me to look at something. I pressed the link, and what popped up was just put your eyes out. Well, I immediately, first of all, I think it has no hold on me because it has no activity in me at all. I immediately, as soon as I could find the delete button, because my both eyes were practically put out, <laughs> I'm like, you got to be. And, you know, I immediately turned the thing off as quickly as I possibly could. No. You know, your eyes are filled with that. All you got, what you got to do is just cry out, God, Father, erase that thing from my mind, my thinking. Though it has no place on me, I know what, I know what, what seed ca broadcasting seed is. So we deal with it. We sponge it. We eliminate it. We don't allow any activity of it. And so I recognize, my goodness, you know, it's just one of those moments. Today I had one of those moments. Look at what people are constantly being saturated with. And because on my, on, my, um, on my iPhone, I have protections. So he would send that thing to me. I don't trade it in my iPhone. Oh, it won't come up. On my iPad, I've got all the protections. Every protection is there. Just on my computer, I didn't have those same kind of protections, so the thing came up. Well, I'm thinking about how many people don't have protections? How many people haven't set limits? How many people are carried about by this thing? Because they've never understood the difference between lie and truth. Demon spirits and the Holy Spirit. I mean, I praise God that m most of you, if not all of you in here, have begun to fully deal with that reality. Because I'm telling you, a lot of those who call themselves uh, believers, call themselves born again, they've never dealt with the, re the reality, the absolutism of lie and truth. Uh, of, of darkness and light, of death and life, of Satan and God, of demon spirits and the Holy Spirit. They've never, they, they interact with demon spirits and they wonder, how is it? How is it? How is it that we have no power over demons? They're not subject to us. And so then they make doctrines up to where that, you know, we're not, that we don't have the same power of demon spirits because they got to make doctrines up that fit their own experience. What's that? inference it's not even anecdotal in some respect it's anecdotal because they tried to cast out a devil and the devil didn't go out right yeah. so now they call fact they derive fact from something that seemed to be based upon experience 
right? How do we get out of all of that? How do we ultimately say, I'm going to be conformed to the word of the Lord? And I talk this way in the school of the spirit on several levels for, for one reason, because it's what God has made very real to me. First from his word, not by personal revelation. First from his word. Any personal revelation has to completely conform to the word of God. Otherwise, wait a minute. <laughs> Forget about it. Huh? It ain't real. One day I was, I was sitting in my house and, and I was just thanking the Lord. I said, Father, thank you so much for the authority you've given me over demon spirits. And I was just, you know, we had just come back from a meeting and I mean, it was like there was no demon spirit that could stand against us. It was just radical. It was amazing. <laughs> you know, we've been in some contests too. I mean, Daniel was running the camera for me one time and we were in Papua New Guinea and there was about 15,000 plus people there that night. And the witch doctors were there and they, were they called in the birds and the birds started dive bombing the people. It was pretty hectic. <laughs> and it's like, I just ignored the thing, you know? Because I wait for a divine unction. It's like, you know, well, devil, mind you might have got your night, but wait till what's going to happen tomorrow night, kind of thing. And then we've been in situations where we just, you know, raise our hands and just devils go out, people who are mentally insane and schizophrenics and, you know, all kinds of demonic activity, completely healed, totally delivered. Beautiful thing. And, you know, it, so we, we have the whole extreme. It's where sometimes, like, huh, I flew into one nation. I said, they said, it's the, rainy, it's, it's the rainy season. You can't come in here. It's the rainy season. We won't be able. I said, listen, I'll tell you right now. You know, I come to you on the highest authority in terms of recommendation, and I did, with respect to men. I said, now listen to me. Listen to me. I'll pay for everything, okay? And I'll tell you right now, when I come, and I come in the middle of the rainy se season, when it's full set in, as soon as I land, it will quit raining. And then you know that the Lord sent me, and we'll have a great move of God. And it happened. There's other times I've gone in. <laughs> I said, when I get there, it won't rain. And I got there, and it wasn't raining. And then, like, the second day, <laughs> and there's a downpour. It wasn't really a downpour. It, just, it was just sprinkles. But for me, it was a downpour, because I'm standing there going, Father, because there's a place you can walk with God and you prophesy it and Father will make it back it up. How'd you like that? There's a place that you can walk with God. You proclaim it and he won't let your words fall to the ground. He'll establish them. There's a place you can walk with God that whatever you ask him, he'll do it. He just hears you talking on his behalf, not so that you can have a vacation in Hawaii. Oh God, I pray. <laughs> I mean, maybe there's some places that you can get to do that. Now I've heard, now I must back up because I've heard some people, you know, that's walk with God and they didn't have a vacation for a long time and they asked us some, some specific things and they got it. And my mama told me about a person who had such a miracle anointing and he took her out for a date one night. She was one of the great Pentecostal churches of America in Chattanooga, Tennessee. He took her out for a date one night and he sat there and said, now watch this. You see that car over there? The lights are going to come on right now. Boom, lights come on. Okay, lights go off. The lights went off. Huh? That's what he did to impress the girl he took out on a date. <laughs> and other such things. Now, what we're going to see is he, had pro he would declare, you know, uh, a truck with, uh, you know, a pink cab and a white, you know, whatever, getting ready to come down the road. Whoosh, there it is. My mom wasn't really that impressed. <laughs> but she related the story to me from the time I was a little guy, different stories like that, just to cause me, help me understand when you get into a place, there's a place you can walk with God in total abandonment that is quite amazing. Father has made, it, Father has made a realm available to us that we think is fantasy because we live in fantasy. Hmm? We, we, God has made a realm to us that we think is uh, in, inaccessible because we've made ourselves inaccessible to Him in many ways. Think about it. I'm talking about you can go to work and work 10 hours a day and God the Holy Ghost could be right there on your lips and filling you every part of your being. Huh? Or you can go to work and get immersed in the realms of a stronghold of demon spirits and you don't even know where it's coming. You're getting hit blindsided because people around you are giants for the kingdom of darkness. And you don't know how to be a giant for the kingdom of God. And you're getting hit with all kinds of demon power. People, we're going to have to understand the practical realities and beauty and splendor of what it means to walk in the spirit because, hey, listen, 
Job may have had a hedge, but we've been baptized in the hedge. Uh -huh. And there is a place of inaccessibility if we're willing to walk this thing out with God. You know, Jesus said to the disciples, he said, pray. Otherwise, you're going to end up being overcome by temptation. You're going to be taken away, led astray like, a, uh, like a, uh, you know, an ox to the slaughter. He said, he said, pray lest you be led into temptation. Taken over by, you know, led against your will, as it were. And he said, well, you're just talking about that night. No, it's every night. It's continually. Jesus went out, Jesus went out and began to pray. And I'm going to tell you, listen to me. Because then... Unfortunately, this has been the fall of many men. How are the mighty fallen? Huh? How are they, how they, how are they that had the anointing upon them cast down? Huh? When Jesus had some of the greatest miracles in his ministry, it just so happens to be highlighted, he went and prayed all night. A lot of people do it the other way around. Huh? When they don't have anything going on, then they're going praying all night, seeking God, oh God, help me, help me. And then all of a sudden, they have a great success, and now they're reveling in it. Huh? It's time to, you know, it's time to celebrate. Ooh, 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 ooh. <laughs> Looky here. You're going to have to understand. You're going to have to understand the enemy you're up against here. You're going to have to understand the landscape of the battle. You're going to have to understand your desperate need uh, to rely upon the Holy Ghost and how... To how to move past all the self-interest and all the circumstances and all the influences around you to be only focused, laser focused on the Holy Ghost. There are spiritual activities that have been, you know, that have really been under far, far, far underrated and they're the top most. The Word of God is Word, is life, it's Spirit. I, I've been privileged since a young person, a little guy, to be able to be around the mighty men of God, those people who had the greatest anointings of their generation. Even up into the present day, I've never felt the anointing of manifest presence of God like I have sitting down reading His Word. I praise God for all those men. I praise God for all their anointings. And but 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 the the, the glory of God. There's a realm, a place that you can tap into the expressions of the power of God. And so many people have just taken taken for granted. Many people have never really begun to even have enough wisdom and insight to deal with the influences of doubt. Doubt floods them, and they don't even realize that they're up against a demonic attack of doubt and unbelief. I can cast out doubt and unbelief. It, it isn't just some passive thing. Oh, well, they got doubt and unbelief. It's just, you know, deal with it. It's like passive poor people. Now we're going to have to spend, you know, 100 years getting them into the faith. No. No, we can deal with it. We can change the atmosphere. You can change. Son, you can change the atmosphere. Elizabeth, you can change the very atmosphere. You know it. You can, and once you know it, once you feel it, once you touch it, everything's different. Listen, I'm telling you, far greater than any miracle that could, anyone could perform is the ability to say no to Satan's lust. Jesus writes unto them the overcomer. He said, to the overcomer, I will grant for you to sit down with me in my throne, even as I sat down with my father in his throne. There's nothing that more validates walking in the Holy Ghost being led by the Spirit, being in the school of the Spirit, than being able to say no to sin and everything that Satan is doing. Jesus said, Satan comes, has nothing in me. I want to be able to say, and I can say, Satan comes, has nothing in me. Uh, I've given my emotions over to holy emotions. I won't allow unholy emotions. It's a grievous thing to me. Where did it start? It started off just simply saying, Lord, I want to learn how to hate evil. My daddy set me down when I was, he just tried to call me. If you miss call, I miss his call. Sent me down, I was five years old. He said, son, let me tell you something. God gives you a lifetime to deal with sin, to say no to it. The moment that you finally say no to it completely, I'm five years old. The moment you say no to it completely and absolutely is the moment that you begin to experience the glory of heaven. On a scale, that's always available for everyone. People live under the mercies of God and they say, take that as a validation. <laughs> it's the mercies of God. It's not validating you. It's the mercy of God. Come on, people. He's called those that are far away to the Scythian. He says, come on in, stand here by the consecrated. That's what he said. Think about it. Scythians, the people of southern Russia, modern day southern Russia, most vile people alive in the day of Paul. Read about them historically. Vile people, the most wicked, immoral people. He says, come on in. And we take that as validation. 
No, it's God's grace and God's gift and God's mercy. Saying, come on and taste the sea. Huh? <laughs> Many people have been touched by the glory of his presence. And it is a, it'd be just a, it's a shake and a laugh and a roll and a woo -hoo. And they never allowed that beautiful encounter to say, I want more. Look at Joshua as he stepped into the school of the Spirit. When he stepped into the school of the Spirit, and he has, he, all he knows, all he knows is this man named Moses has a word from God. He begins to be cooperative in every way that he knows, but all of a sudden, he has an encounter with God. Now his servitude, his cooperation goes to another level, and the Scripture says he did not want to depart from the, he did not depart from the door of the tabernacle. He had a taste, and he said, whoa! This is good. So what did he do? 40 years. Whoa! This is good. He wasn't saying, well, God, why don't you use me? Oh, where's my position? Oh, oh, oh. You know, with all the crazy nonsense that we get into and we don't realize it's self-serving. We don't realize it's right out of motivated, right out of the self-realm. Well, Father, Father gets all, deals with all of that when we find ourselves just constantly saying, Lord Jesus, all I want is you. And I mean, it's a fiery trial. And I've watched so many people fall off because of disappointment. I've been there, people. I've been there. I, you know, I've been there. I, I, look, before honor, there, there is, believe it. Before honor, there is, what is it? Ouch. And this big humility. I've been there many times. I mean, one of the, one of the places, and I, could, I can look back and I can see where I easily missed it. But at the same time, I can tell you where I got promoted. I can tell you events. I can, I can take you to the calendar. I can show you actual events that took place in God that I could have missed out on if I would have had the wrong answer. I had, I had my dear friend Carlos Anacondia here for 10 days. And we were having, you know, about 5,000 people in the meeting every night outside. And Sunday rolls around, and I'm thinking, we don't have enough people to fill up the, front two ro the two front rows. This is going to look pathetic. And, the, and, and man, I'm going to tell you, we, it was decked out. We had a platform that was right at um, five and a half foot tall. Well, I mean, it was big. It was giant. It was, you know, it was probably what? It was probably a... 50 by 75, 50 by 100 platform. It's huge. Speakers, it's all, we had it all. We just had it all. And I get to the meeting, front two rows, the front row was not even full. And you have 5,000 chairs out there. I went and sat down in my corner, and I go, Lord, why do you have to humiliate me like this? Because I had already said in my heart, I said, look, I don't want to make the people go and take and move this, 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 the equipment and, and what we need back over into the church because at that time we had, our church was a little over. The main sanctuary that where we met in was a little over um, 20,000 square feet. 20. Set 2,000 chairs easily. And I, I, Lord, I, I don't want to go move things back over there and, you know, everybody's off because they've been in meetings 10 days. Who needs to go Sunday morning? Right? Goodness, we, we already got bonus points. <laughs> and I sat down in my corner and I said, Lord, why? I'm not doing nothing. I'm not singing. I'm not doing nothing kind of thing. I'm not, you know, I'm, I was there. Why me? There's a 2,000 people easy that could be here this morning. Where are they? What really out of the evidence is the Lord made sure they stayed away. Just for me. And the Spirit of the Lord spoke to me and said, why are you doing this? I mean, I got busted. I mean, I busted. <laughs> for you, Lord. Just for you. And of course, as soon as the Lord said that, I got up, man. I preached like I was preaching to, you know, 50,000 people. I got up. I, I grabbed the... I went over, I grabbed the guitar. I didn't feel like a fool on a, you know, I didn't feel like the prophet running around with his bottom showing. <laughs> huh? Or the fool on the throne. 
the court jest on the throne. You know what I'm saying? It's great. Satan creates those circumstances for us. I'm on this big platform in front of 5,000 people. Huh? 5,000 chairs. I'm on this big platform in front of 50 people. I think there were 50 there. There's probably more than 50 there. You know, I, the front row was probably 200. I was hoping for 400, two first two rows. But promotion came immediately. Within a year, the Lord had launched me out in a whole new other dimension in ministry. A whole other level of the anointing being manifested in my life in terms of just separated unto him. And then when the anointing is there, the increase of the anointing brings an outworking of the manifest power of God in our life, because we, you know, where our Father is, my goodness. Are you, can you hear what I'm saying? Yeah. You hear, can, are, you understand about school of spirit? Sure. You wanna learn how to prophesy? Don't want a mixture, huh? I was just reveling back to this other story. I was just reveling, Father, thank you for much, so much authority over demon spirits. And, and the Holy Spirit spoke to me, he said, I wanna, show, I wanna bring you into a place where you can see with greater accuracy the things into the future. The Lord said it to me a couple of times. Some of you have heard me say this because, you know, when God speaks, you say it over and again because it's true. He spoke. Well, it's not imagination. Papa spoke to me. Huh? There's things that the Lord's, when, you, when Father speaks to you, it isn't just some kind of a thrill. You run on it for years. I mean, I've run on words from the things that the Lord told me he was going to do in ministry in San Diego for more than 30 years. I was at one word from heaven. And when you get a word from heaven, you can run on it for many days. You can run, you just, the Lord spoke to me, I want to show you with greater accuracy with the things that you're going to be in the future. I said, Lord, I want to, I want to learn. I'm going to show you with, I want to show you with greater accuracy the things which are going to be in the future. Father, I want to learn, I want to learn. And the Spirit of the Lord said to me, said, I want to teach you about holiness. And I'm dialoguing with the Lord like this, and I said, Lord, I, holiness? I did a whole commentary on the book of Leviticus. I was raised in the holiness movement. Holiness, isn't that my subject? Come here, I wanna teach you about holiness. That day the Lord defined holiness for me in a way that I never understood. He said holiness is being here with me in the holies of holies. And I, I stepped in, I just began to step into a realm saying, Lord, I want that. He said, well, you're gonna have to leave all this other stuff behind. That's the point, the struggle. Hmm? You know, I was on my way to medical school. And then, you know, I was on my way to pursue my own life, you know, and the things I wanted to do. And, you know, I began to think, well, you know, I'll be probably more suited to doing, you know, clinical research. And so, you know, just devote my life to, to school, do MD, PhD, and that's a devotion of your life to school. And somebody spoke to me and said, you have to begin to move in the, Things which God called you from and separated you from the womb to do. And I tell you right now, I felt like going in the bathroom and throwing up. I got sick to my stomach. I said, there is no way. You talk about bitterness in my belly. There is no way. I've spent my whole life being a son of a preacher man. And I'm not going to put my kids through that. And I, I'll be a supporter of ministry, but a supportive bro, but I'm not doing it. And Father calls us many times to wonderful, glorious things, and we get it's all bitterness on the inside of us. Huh? We're, it's in, it, we're, there's trepidation. We feel like we've got to give something up. And, and that's a great thing to do. I mean, I, there's been many, many times I've been ministering by the Spirit of the Lord and just begin to call people into complete abandonment, to leave everything and follow the Lord Jesus. And people come to me and say, well, I'm telling you right now, when you begin to say that, I just start feeling sick in my stomach. Yeah, you know why? Because you're holding on to your life in this world. You know how I know? I, 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 I would experience exactly what you're doing and experiencing. I told the Lord how I was going to live my life and how he could fit into it. And anybody who hasn't done that is in denial. And we want to get you out of denial and bring you into the promised land. Amen. Hallelujah. 
out of denial and into the promise. Amen. Amen. So, we're just talking to you about the principles of the school of the Spirit. The principles of the school of the Spirit is being willing to be set apart to a place called holiness. That's sanctification. To be consecrated, set apart, to say, Lord, I'm yours. And are, are there challenges? Yeah, there are challenges. When we've given ourselves over, look, you know what? The Lord redeemed us. He redeemed us. And when he redeemed us, he gave us a new heart and he gave us a new spirit. And he put a spirit within us. But guess what we still have? Huh? Guess what we still have? Huh? Guess what we still have? This, what does that mean? That means that's nothing. That doesn't, that, that means so nefesh or suke, either Hebrew or Greek, means your whole entire life in your existence. What do you still have? No, no. Well, yeah, you do. You have your will. Okay. But more fundamentally, and on the bigger, on the bigger picture of things, what was the first thing man got that he shouldn't have? The knowledge of good and evil. When we got redeemed, we didn't lose the knowledge of good and evil. Father, I mean, that was way too big for men then, and it's primarily way too big for men now. How in the world are you going to deal with the world knowledge? We're, uh, the knowledge of good and evil. I hear people talking about the flesh, nature, talk about everything other than what the point is. And that's just the tactics of Satan. You know what I'm saying? Just always trying to get you to believe he's where he's not. Do you, you understand that strategy of war? Yeah. How many of you study your students of war? It's a strategy, one of the primary strategies of war, you know? The knowledge of good and evil is what's got to be confronted here. Father said, you can't have it. It's mine. You can't have it. Men disobeyed, got it, too much for him. What did God do? He didn't just give us a new heart and a new spirit. He gave us the Holy Ghost. So now we living in the spirit can learn to choose good and refuse the evil. Watch Jesus. That's who, what he shows us. He shows us the school of the spirit. His diet was what? Milk and con concentrate milk. What's his butter? Huh? Right? And honey. Your law is sweeter than honey in the honeycomb. The word of the Lord is, is likened unto honey. The word of the Lord is likened unto milk and unto butter. And he is diet, a strong diet of these things. So that why? So what he could do? Learn to do what? Choose, Choose the good and refuse evil. To love righteousness and to cleave to the ways of God. How? By the word of God. By the divine nature. He wasn't baptized in the Holy Ghost. He had the divine nature. He was born with the divine nature. Do you understand? Does everybody understand that? He's born with a divine nature. He wasn't born with a fallen Adamic nature. You understand that? Yeah. Under, people don't get this. They don't get it. They're got, they got, they're trying to build a foundation on a lie or trying to build a foundation on a half truth. And they're never going to get anywhere down the road with God. Father gave us a divine nature when we were born of the Spirit. He gave us the ability. He gave us a new heart and He gave us a new spirit. And He gave us the ability to be submitted to His Word and to be taught by the Holy Spirit. Beautiful. Baptism of the Holy Ghost is to empower us. And, and, but we already, and, and at the very new birth, at the very onset of the new birth, we have all the ability now to recognize we can do nothing of ourselves. So we're now we're totally dependent upon the only one who knows how to handle the knowledge of good and evil. And we don't recognize, wait a minute, we have to, with our own will, draw a line and say, wait, I don't even, evil's not even a choice for me. It's not even an option for me. And thus resist Satan's steadfast in the flesh. Right? Yeah. No. In the faith. We have to learn how to resist him steadfast in the faith. We have to learn how to resist by the power that is at work on the inside of us. This glory from heaven, a total dependency on Christ in us, the hope of glory. Come on, let's understand. But if we don't define these things, listen, I'm telling you, I watch over and again how people get stuck in the rut of trying to do it out of human discipline, out of human ability. Okay? Have you begun in the spirit to now be made, per to be made perfect by the flesh? Within that framework, that word means human ability. Jesus was manifested in the flesh. You understand that? Was he manifest, manifested in a fallen nature? So you got to understand that there's different applications by denotation of the word flesh. 
And I'm not going to get into that. I'm just ra- laying the ba- foundation and the basis for the school of the spirit. The foundation and the basis of the school of the spirit is truth. What is truth? God's word is truth. We want to understand it like God said it. Not how various different, you know, theologues, denominations, traditions have brought it down to us. Because we can't get nowhere with that. Somebody says, soulish nature. Show me that in the Bible. Show me that in the Bible. Jesus is much in my soul as he is in my spirit. The idea of a soulish nature and that God is only interested and participates with pneuma, our spirit, comes from Gnostics. It's, it's Neoplatonism. It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a doctrine of Aristotle. It has nothing to do with the Word of God. It's, it's because Thomas Aquinas took Aristotle and put it to Christianese and it became church philosophy and church doctrine. And I can take you back and show you, that, show you the pages. Because you can't show me the pages in the Bible that it espouses the stuff that we believe. I can show you in the pages of Thomas Aquinas that espouses this stuff that everybody teaches and says that this is what the tradition of the church. Somebody said to me not too long ago, said, you can't rewrite history. I said, I'm not rewriting history. I'm not rewriting your history. I know what your history is. I'm defining to you what the Bible says. And there's a big gigantic difference. Are you rewriting history? I'm not rewriting history. I'm defining what the Bible says. I know what your history is. I know you by, and then, you know, I don't want to go into that. <laughs> by de- definition of what many people believe, it's total heresy. When it comes to really contrasting with the word of God, all I'm saying people, the spirit of truth is only going to be fundamentally hooking up with and, and, and working in the midst of truth. Truth, not inference, not anecdotals, perceptions, not fact. It's a fact that you can't walk on the water, but it's not the truth. Hmm? It may be a fact that you can't over, uh, overcome sin, but it's not the truth. Hmm? It may be a fact that you must sin every day, not the truth. Somebody said, oh, you tell me we don't have to sin every day? Yeah, praise God, I'm, I'm telling you that. Isn't it good? Ah, I just don't believe it. Well, do you think, let me just ask you, do you think you can go one second without sin? Well, sure. Well, then live second to second. Huh? I mean, I, even, I wouldn't even bring that up. Can you think, I'd even go ahead and explode that a little bit for you. Do you think you could so live in the Holy Ghost for one hour? That you'd be so saturated, so overwhelmed, so filled up, so yielded, so submitted that you could go with sin without one hour? Huh? Go, with sin, go without sin for one hour? Absolutely. Do you believe that God called you to live and abide and dwell in the Holy Ghost? To live in the spirit. There's no sin there. Ouch. Well, bottom line of it is, before that's ever even going to be a possibility, you've got to believe it. I've had people that come back and say, well, you know, you've got to give people time to mature and grow. Absolutely. But I mean, at some point in time, after 50 years, and we're parting the whiskers to put in the bottle, someone's going to have to grow up. We're going to give people time to grow, mature. Give me a break. Ah, oh, we've got to lay aside the sin, the weight, the, sin, the weight and the sin that so easily besets us. Get her done. The, the bottom line of it is I've been hearing people say that for a long time. They're not making any progress. Get her done. So that you may do what? You may do what? Run the race with joy. What race? The one that Jesus showed us to run. Huh? The one that Paul ran. The one that you don't even get started until you get rid of the weight and the sin. Does that make sense? Yeah, it's true. I mean, every point in the word of God. Amen. Jesus bore our sins in his own body on the tree that we being dead to sin, dead, cut off from it, should live unto righteousness. 
what bottom line of it is people don't want to get into the truth. They want to have an excuse for their failure, an excuse for their problem, an excuse for their issues, an excuse for their disobedience, an excuse for all the other things that go on within the practical nature of their experience, which is inference, anecdotal, and fact. It's not reality. It's not truth. If the Word of God describes it, then that's who you and I are. If the Word of the Lord tells us to do that, then that's what we're going to do. And how are we going to do it? By our own human ability. It's not by might. It's not by power, but by the Holy Ghost. It's by the Spirit. It's by, it's by the Spirit of truth. It's by the life-giving Spirit. Now, well, I'm just taking away every excuse for sin. And my, I, haven't done, I haven't done near the job I could do. Give me some more time. I mean, I believe with the, uh, God's given me the ability to pull every crutch out from underneath a person. Every place that people try to stand to say that they got to live under demonic influence and they just can't live without it. You just, you just understand. This is too good. I can't live without it. I mean, how can you go without it? I was talking to a preacher one day. He said, he said, Pastor, he said, do you really believe that there's a possibility that we could actually live our life without sin? And this, is, this is the wonderful man of God, and I'm not going to tell his name. And, and God, God's done wonderful things for him. And I said, okay, well, wait, wait, wait. Okay, time out. Okay, let's just talk about it. Let's just talk about the 17 works of the flesh. Okay? So I said, did you commit adultery today? <laughs> he said, well, of course not. I said, mentally or in any way that you could imagine. Could, no. He said, we're doing good. We got one down out of 17, 16 left. <laughs> did you commit fornication today? No. <laughs> did you commit acts of homosexuality or bestialities today? Did you lust after a goat, <laughs> cow. Because that's what uncleanness is. <laughs> See, I'm driving my point home here, okay? This stuff ain't as good as you think it is. It ain't as hard to overcome as you say it is. When you get out of relativism, and you get into absolutism, come on now, listen to me. Did you participate with lasciviousness today? No. How about witchcraft? Did you get after witchcraft today? You cursed anybody today? You cast a spell on anyone? <laughs> Set in a pentagon, anything? <laughs> Burn incense to devils, anything? And we were already, we just, just spent a few moments and we were, we, would, we're, we knocked seven of them down. And we not, had no influence upon us. We only have 10 left to go. How many people you've been hating today? Just hating them, wanting to kill them. Hating them on the murder level. Huh? Who did you enter in strife with? Who did you commit sedition against? And reality of it is, we look at each other and go, I don't want any of those things. I don't either. I don't want them. You don't want them. God doesn't want them. We got a team going on over here. Now all we got to do is gather up on this thing and we're going to get something done. Ha, hallelujah. Now we're going to have to make God a bit bigger than Satan. And really it comes right down to this. I'm going to close with this. Because, it, you know, I was just telling John this, you know, because he's having to deal with different things in, in, in Havana. But, you know, when I was in, in Japan, I'm there on the 47th floor of the tallest building, the biggest city in the, in the world, in Tokyo. And I said, Lord, and I was upset, man. I was, I was broken. I was messed up. I'm saying, Lord, this just ain't right. You look very, very small here. And Satan is very, very big. And, and here is a free society that's by and large totally untouched by you. And I'm just going at it. I mean, I'm going at it in the sincerity of my heart. Just crying out to God, why? How is this? How is this? How can this stand? Why? Oh, God. Because his passion is my passion. I mean, I feel it. You might get yelling and screaming and hollering about some of your stuff. I'm just yelling and screaming and hollering about Papa's stuff. Five o'clock in the morning. The next morning, five o'clock in the morning. The Lord woke me up, five in the morning. And he said, all authority is given to me in heaven and earth. I'm looking for somebody to agree with me. Christ Jesus said, all authority is given to me in heaven and earth. When the Lord talks to me, all the time he uses scripture. All authority is given to me in heaven and earth. 
I'm looking for someone to agree with me. People are going to have to agree with God. Amen. We're going to have to agree with the, the Lord on the levels that we don't like to start with. On the people that we want to have just cause to hate. Or have unforgiveness towards because it's equivalent. From Father's view, from the Word of God view. We're going to have to, we're going to, have to deal with every shade of hate. That's short of the love of God. Christ Jesus showed. Not, our, not subjective love. He defined love. As much as he perfectly defined faith, he perfectly defined love. Here in his love. He said, this is what love looks like. I'm showing you what love looks like. I want you to do the same thing. And, we, and we're going to have to be willing to deal with all those shades of hate. To fall short of love. And get rid of all of our excuses because we all got a right, we've all got an excuse. It's relativism. It's Huh? In reality, more people are universal, universalists than want to go ahead and admit it. Because you're going to include yourself in the kingdom of God when you're totally wrong. Are you with me? That's yeah. universalism. Then. Huh? In many respects, it is. We have to come under the rule of the word. If you come under the rule of the word, guess what you do? Come under the rule of the Holy Ghost. Huh? Oh, yeah, you do. The word comes before the Holy Ghost. Jesus came before the Holy Spirit came. The Word comes before the Holy Ghost. Are you listening to me? Yes. So I just, I just encourage you, come under, the, come under this wonderful rule of the Spirit. Just say, Lord, I want every one of my emotions to conform to yours. You ask me, I'll do it. It's, a, it's an amazing thing. I had a great breakthrough one day. I learned that all I had to say to the Lord was, lead me not into temptation. And Wow, this works. This works. I ask, he does it. And now I begin a, a whole new divine activity of the Holy Spirit. It's almost like the Father's waiting for us to give him permission to bless us. I'll say it again. It's almost like Father's waiting for us to give him permission to bless us. Did we just ask according to his will? Father, lead me not into temptation. Deliver me from all the evil. Ha! Because yours is the kingdom. Yours is the power. Yours is the honor. Yours is the glory. You in charge. Huh? And so he says, I'm going to show you how now. I'm going to show you. I'm going to lead you in a way. Huh? No temptation given unto man except for the Lord's made a way of escape. Hallelujah. Ha, doxia, kingdom, makate. And a whole new dimension of the Holy Ghost activity began in my life. To where that when I would begin, when there was a temptation out in front of me, you know, God knows everything we're going to go through in a day. He knows what we're going to encounter. He, he's really amazing. He's brilliant. <laughs> and then all of a sudden, the Holy Ghost began to make intercession through me and prepare me. Oh, he's so good. He's going to, he's our keeper. He keep us. You can't tell me that our keeper can't keep us. Huh? He's a hedge about us. He's baptized us in the Holy Ghost in fire. Huh? He's our protector. He's, a, he's our establisher. Huh? Come on now. I'm tired of this nonsense, heretical doctrines that people have bought into hook, line, and sinker and leaves them powerless to overcome sin, leaves them powerless to ever be what Jesus said. I write unto you, young men, because you've destroyed Satan. You've defeated him, rather, at every point. If you overcome as I overcome, the voice, the, the, the voice of the overcomer, that's the true voice of the overcomer. You overcome even as I overcame. You'll sit down with me in my throne. Lord Jesus, how is that possible? Have you ever said that? I've said that. Lord, how is that possible? You never sinned. I have. How can I overcome as you overcome? And the Lord made it, has made it very, very plain to me, very clear. You start asking Father questions, and he'll start taking the points of the Scripture, showing you the Word. He shows us how to live our life in him. And how to allow him to live his life through us. And then there is a place of being that which he has done. And having accounted to us everything that he did in, in, in every way that he lived. And then that's been twisted. That's been twisted by people. And they've wrestled that to literally. People wrestle the scripture. Listen to me. Understand these words. People wrestle the scripture to their own destruction. Emphasis. Highlight, underline, destruction. 
Somehow that's missed. Don't wrestle scripture. Let us say what it says. Huh? Amen. When the spirit of holiness, the Holy Spirit, is living on you, inside of you. He's your master. He's your ruler. And you're being willing to be led by him at every point. Guided by him. You're willing to dwell in him. My, my, my. This is the school of the spirit. There is a dedication, a consecration. It's not some kind of sensational thing. Huh. It's the living life. It's the living, practical life of the Lord Jesus. And it's beautiful. Then, then we can stand and say, I doubtless shall come to dreams and visions and revelation and the Lord. And then you can just stand and say, I'll, I'll go ahead at any, any time needed, I'll function in all the gifts of the Spirit. And there's more than nine. Believe me. Paul just emphasized nine. Nine gifts of the Spirit in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Now, Father, I just thank you for giving everybody a, a, a great strength and a great courage and boldness to recognize that they can possess this land, that all of the giants, that all the hindrances, that all the things that have been great temptations, bigger than they could deal with, can easily be overcome. Not by might, not by power, but by your spirit. Father, I just thank you that you'll show each person, teach each person as you've come to teach us and show us how to live in all the ways of your righteousness and all the ways of your holiness and all the ways of your purity and all the ways of your godliness and all the ways of your beauty and all the ways of your splendor and all the ways of your health and all the ways of your goodness and all the ways of your pleasure and all the ways of your blessings. And it just keeps on going. Mm -mm -mm. And all we have to do is just say no to that which is wrong and turn to you and say, yes, strengthen me now. Help me now. I can honestly say that of myself, I've never overcome or never dealt with or defeated one single sin or temptation. I've done it all by the Spirit of the Lord. Hallelujah. I've done it all by His help, by His grace, by His divine power and ability to find myself living this wonderful life, being blessed. My Elizabeth, Ruthanna, Daniel, Joshua, Ali, Anna, Naomi. That's where it starts right now for me. That's Because it's first. What's close to you? Your family. Those are the brothers and sisters in Christ. Family. There's, you know, the different layers of family. And then it just keeps on going. Done there. Father wants to make us a blessing to the earth. Let's just be it. Let's just let's just walk with God, be sequestered, consecrated, set apart to just be taught of Him. And then after having sitting in school all day, you walk out and you speak just like Him. Sitting in school all day, you walk out and you just act just like Him. Just get saturated in His presence. Amen. Now, real quickly, I'm happy to ask, answer any, any burning questions that you may have. I'll be happy to do that. Anybody's got any questions? I mean, I want you to understand, I don't ever feel challenged by questions. I don't ever feel, uh, you know, somehow insulted by questions. I love questions. And, uh, you know, like the other night, Revelation study, I figured there, there were so many questions people needed to ask, you know, that people don't know the answers to, but... It's ha I'm happy for also for all the folks who then emailed me asking me the questions. I'm like, why didn't you ask those in the meeting? So many people need to ask those questions. Everyone grows from that. So if there's like a practical thing. In other words, I want to be help helpful to you. And the way that I want to be most helpful to you in walking in the school spirit rather than training. Because, you know, I, I participate in training you to prophesy. You know, and there's, I, I, we, I have this all the time. People tell me, well, I want to come under the authority. I want to be submitted. And I'm standing up here and I say, well, lift your hands towards heaven and just get real emotional with the Lord right now. And people stand there going, obviously, you don't want to be under authority. Obviously, you want to do it your own way. So, you know, that's, people are stuck that way. It takes a long time for people to get out of that. And they can't, because they've not been able to recognize their self. 
versus the Holy Ghost. They've not been well, unwilling to recognize when they're under authority or when they're the ones that in, are in authority. So people miss out on a lot of things like that. But I think that, you know, and, and of course modeling the gifts of the Spirit, modeling gifts of healing, and modeling miracles, and modeling the word of knowledge, and modeling revelation. There's no replacement for that. We're going to give ourselves to that and to do it by God's help and grace even more effectively. But I want to help you on the point of where you're dealing with temptation, where you don't know how to deal with this. This thing's coming at you, and it comes at you, and you just get taken out by it. I want to help you. You can come to me on a personal level, on a private level, you know. However you want to come. You can do it on a general level. Well, what, if you, what if you're dealing with this? What if you're constantly having to confront a controversial adversarial people? How do, you, how do you manage that? I want to be able to help you in very practical ways, but you've got to be willing to come out and ask. I wait for, by and large, I wait for people to ask because when you ask, you're the most receptive. When you don't ask, you know, we don't know what's that, what's that going to result in. So I want you to just feel, you know, free to, to, to ask me, to say, look, I am fun. I'm dealing with this problem. How do I face it? Because we've all dealt with the same issues. There's nobody here. You're not, and there's not a single person here that you're dealing with something that someone else hasn't, that all the rest of us don't deal with or have, to, or have dealt with. And, and I'm going to just give you an example. Anybody in this, you know, people that were, I, so many people that I know um, who were addicted to smoking cigarettes, Huh? And then the Lord totally healed them, delivered them. And you see him 10 years later. Are you still fighting that temptation? What temptation? Well, you know, your addiction to cigarettes. Man, I hadn't thought about that since the Lord set me free. Guess what? Here's a place that you can get past temptation on areas where you defeat that thing. Huh? And I guarantee you, if I got you to thinking, you'd, I could tell you and you'd remember, rather, areas of your life where you thought, how am I ever going to overcome that? This thing is so big. It's so intense. How am I ever going to stop that thing? Huh? And now it's like you don't even think about it. Right? All the rest of it, same way. You got to face it. You got to say no to it by the power of the living God. And there's a way, there's a way to bring closure to it. I'm here to help. God, the Holy Ghost, is here to help. Christ Jesus suffered and, and was tempted in every area in which we are tempted, tempted, and he was not, and he did not sin. And the scripture says, he condemned sin in the flesh, saying sin does not belong in the human frame. God, man was created in the image and likeness of God, and I'm here to prove to you that sin has no power. Somebody said, oh, he did that because he was just God. Well, you can do that because you've been born of God. Huh? He did that because he was God. No problem. True, 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 true. Praise God. Now he lives in you. Now let him live. Huh? So you're without excuse. Huh? Because then you have to say, well, he don't live in me. Hallelujah. <laughs> and you're not going to say that, are you? Because then you deny the faith. Yes. <laughs> 